one of the more frustrating things about a lot of Jungians is that when you ask them uh, for a decision and you give them a very careful explanation of what you're asking, you don't get an answer immediately. They will say, well, I've got to sleep on it and see if I have a dream. It can be very irritating uh, and uh, time consuming. But it's deeply ingrained in us uh, through our training and studies that uh, there is a part of the mind that's not fully accessible uh, to our waking life that we need to wait on or attend to. And quite a bit of analysis is dedicated to um, uh, looking at, listening to, trying to um, invite into consciousness what this part of the mind uh, wants to tell us. So um, I call it the lunar mind. I wrote a book some years ago called Solar Conscience, Lunar Conscience, um, and talked about uh, two types of um, ways of uh, making ethical decisions, one a more conscious and superego oriented uh, type and one uh, a more um, uh, more tuned in to what I'm calling the lunar mind here. So let me tell you a little bit about what I mean by the lunar mind. Uh, incidentally, uh, the study of uh, the scientific study of dreams and dreaming uh, was begun in the 1950s. Um, in a systematic uh, laboratory sort of way, in, uh, I think at the University of Chicago at first, in dream laboratories. And one of the first findings was that uh, it seemed like there was a correlation between uh, REM sleep and dreaming. So that when people's eyelids flickered while they were sleeping and they were waked up, they would uh, report uh, dreaming. And so for quite a long period of time, there was a close association between REM sleep which is a certain level of sleep that you achieve during uh, the sleep cycle, and uh, dreaming. And later studies have shown that uh, dreaming isn't restricted to REM sleep. It takes place during other parts of the, of the sleep cycle as well. <clears throat> so that was in later studies un unhooked. Uh, REM sleep and the dreaming brain are not exactly uh, synchronized or identical. But this uh, dreaming brain uh, has been very carefully studied by Hobson and other people. And uh, they've looked at it from many angles. They're not terribly interested in the content of the dreams that are produced while they're studying the brain. They're more interested in what the brain is doing while the person is dreaming and what's going on chemically in the brain and what parts of the brain are activated, what parts of the brain are turned off. And the dreaming brain is quite different from the waking brain. So in a sense, we've got two computers running in us. There's a waking computer and a, and a sleeping computer. When you're sleeping, the dreaming brain is operating. When you're awake, when you're awake the waking uh, brain is operating. It might be that while you're awake, the dreaming brain is sort of quietly operating in the background as well, and that you can dip into it every now and then uh, by uh, allowing fantasies to emerge. It's possible that uh, we, we could be more in touch with uh, what's going on in the lunar mind than we normally are. Just to say, I'm a Jungian analyst um, who chanced on neurobiology, really because I was working with a lot of patients with early relational trauma. And I began to see that the research that was coming out of neurobiology and out of attachment research had a great deal to offer to help me to understand how to work. So that's how I come to be sitting here today. When we dream, we experience vivid visual imagery, which enables us to begin to process emotional states of mind previously unavailable to consciousness, just in the way that Hobson described. Emergent met metaphor has long been one of the most powerful vehicles by which the self may achieve greater integration. And we've heard two lovely dreams describing very different aspects of that. Nowhere is this effect more marked than in the work that emerges from the dreaming process. 
Daniel's comments. Dreams have served my creative purpose, both as alarm clocks and teddy bears. They wake me to new awareness of the shackles left from my unfortunate childhood. And by continually providing evidence of my current psychological landscape, they give me the information and courage to advance both consciously and unconsciously. Jung stressed that any threat from the unconscious diminishes as soon as the patient begins to assimilate contents that were previously unconscious.